we're working on the witness for peace, Dorothy Day, today. Dorothy Day is a remarkable prophetic person for peace. And it seems to me that the best way to look at Dorothy Day is to think about that she, uh, she was a brilliant writer. She spent most of her writing doing journalism. She wrote for many newspapers, mostly in the radical wing of things in the um, 1920s. So she wrote for newspapers like the Masses. That'd be one. That's a famous one, socialist newspaper. And then they would close that. They closed that one down. And then she wrote for the New Masses. Uh, and she wrote for others. And then uh, she, just to give you a brief uh, overview of her life, and then we'll, we're going to go into the details of it. She uh, found herself turning more and more to God with her life, and she converted to Catholicism. And but she kept being a journalist, and she eventually started writing for Commonweal and for America magazine, actually. And then she stopped at, at, after covering a big strike, actually, in Washington, D.C., for both Commonweal and America. She stopped at Catholic University and fervently prayed that she could serve e the poor even more. She got back to New York, and somebody introduced her to a gentleman named Peter Morin. And Peter Morin and Dorothy Day, Peter was a French person who was 20 years older than Dorothy, and he was an um, he was a a, a, a person of uh, uh, real poverty. He lived poverty all his life, and out of that relationship between uh, Dorothy and Peter, and Peter was also a a, a very uh, fierce Catholic. And he was, uh, the one of the first things he said to Dorothy is, you need more formation in Catholicism. And he helped her understand some of the dimensions of Catholicism that she hadn't understood before. And she says, uh, I became uh, uh, his disciple, actually. She actually followed Peter Morin as her teacher, okay? And that, that's a very interesting uh, aspect of Dorothy. They founded a, a magazine called The Catholic Worker at the very heart of the Depression, 1933. And then uh, over time, uh, she founded, with the help of the Catholic Worker Movement, houses of hospitality all over the country, and indeed other parts of the world, where urban people who were destitute could come, receive a bowl of soup, a cup of coffee. But the other thing they did in Catholic Worker Houses is they conversed, and they conversed aggressively about ideas. And the ideas that dominated Peter Morin's mind had to do with um, agronomics. He was interested in the problem of getting more people out of the cities and back onto the land. Because it was the height of the Depression and unemployment was sky high, right? In America, we were running about 25% unemployment at that time. Can you imagine? And so he. He was a, a French peasant, and so he saw the, 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 some of the solution to being going back to the land, and well as Dorothy was a city person, and she 
focused on the issues of labor and capital and saw the problem from a point, uh, the more the point of view of justice, like a radical would, okay? So, so the conversation went back and forth all the time between these people. But in the meantime, they founded and worked this Catholic worker movement. It became one of the most important lay movements in the Catholic Church in America before the Second Vatican Council. And indeed, it anticipated the, uh, the reforms of the Second Vatican Council in advancing the dignity of lay people, see? So, and their Christian dignity, above all, their, their uh, ability to articulate faith and to apply faith to the problems of the society. So for Dorothy Day, um, it was really important to be conversant in the ability to apply faith to the problems of injustice. And she used the papal documents to do that, the documents that came from the official church. So we're going to uh, get to know Dorothy in her own words today. Uh, what we're going to depend on is the book, The Long Loneliness. That's her autobiography. She wrote it, I think this originally was published in 51 or 52. And, you, uh, nine, and so at this point, she's already able to kind of look back at the beginning of the Catholic worker movement. And, and she started doing her reflections on it. Uh, a friend of mine said to me that uh, th this is a book like the Confessions of St. Augustine. And I think that that's true. But the thing I would add is that she also is addressing some of the concerns that St. Augustine had in his other famous work, The City of God. She's not just talking about her personal journey. She's combining her personal journey with the movement of history and with the problem of justice in history and the development of her own positions. Let me give you an example of how she developed her view of peace. She started as a pacifist during World War I, but she was only a pacifist during World War I because she was anti-imperialist. She was following the socialist line of pacifism. But as she grew in her understanding of pacifism, she developed her view of pacifism from the Sermon on the Mount. As she, so, so, so that's an example of her development as a person. She went from a very humanistic uh, viewpoint that was without God to a more full and integrated viewpoint with God and with the church. And that makes her journey really relevant to today, I think. Because what we have today in America is a huge falling away of the generation of people from uh, 40 or even a little older than 40, let's say 45, 46, and down, uh, the falling away from not just the Catholic Church, but from all churches in America, all mainline churches, uh, and even evangelical churches, even mega churches, they have this curve. And there's a whole falling away from Christianity occurring in our society right now. So what we want to do with Dorothy is we want to listen to her story about her own falling away, how she had a, 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 a faith of sorts when she was young, and then she loses her faith, and then she returns to faith. And maybe as we reflect on her own words about that, we can get some own insight for our own journey. That's the thing. So her book is called The Long Loneliness. And she takes a quote from a nun 
from the uh, 16th century. And the nun says this, I think, dear child, that the trouble and the long loneliness you hear me speak of is not far from me, which, whensoever it is, happy success will follow. The pain is great, but very endurable, because he who lays on the burden also carries it. So what that nun is saying about the loneliness is that she's open to what loneliness can accomplish in her life. And, where, and that reminds us of John Donne. That goes right back to the first lecture, where John Donne had this struggle to understand the longing within the loneliness that becomes the love. The nun from Mary Ward uh, is the nun here. And she says, the pain is great of this loneliness, right? But it's very endurable because he who lays on the burden also carries the burden. That's Jesus. Dorothy Day was serious about Jesus. This is, this is the key thing. When uh, one of her followers, who had been following her since 1952, he, he, he was a, a medical student, he became a doctor, he brought a group of students to meet Dorothy in the 1970s, be right before she died. And so they, they're interviewing Dorothy. And here's what she says. And this is in reference to uh, um, her own heart journey. It emerges here. She said, I've always worried about unfairness, injustice, going back to when I was your age in college. So she told one of the students who had asked for a summing up, a connection between her life's origins and its eventual outcome, she amplified it in this manner. When I was your age, women couldn't vote, and the poor could fall back on nothing but the charity of the rich. I remember as a girl asking my mother, why? Why weren't things better for people? Why a few owned so much and many had little or nothing? She kept on telling me that there's no accounting for injustice. It just is. I guess I've spent my life trying to account for it and trying to change things just a little. And that's what I believe people like me ought to try to do. We've been given a leg up in the world, so why not try to help others get a bit of a break too? Okay. And the students hear this, but they're not satisfied. They keep asking more about Dorothy's journey. She had, after all, been in prison many times for the street battles she had helped wage. She had led a vigorous, somewhat idiosyncratic intellectual and spiritual life that she expressed in her articles and books. Her deep love of novelists such as Dickens, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and others. But also the church documents I mentioned before, Reverend Navarum and Quadragesimo Anno, which are the documents written by the popes about uh, social justice. So she was, she really uh, read, but she didn't just read uh, the way we think about reading. And this gets to the point of my friend who wants to criticize play acting, right? He's got a problem with the vice of eutropalia. What is eutropalia? Well, it's a vice in, mentioned in scripture of jesting, of acting uh, for uh, uh, joking around. And the reason it's a problem in scripture is that it interferes with contemplation, I think. But here's where Dorothy uh, dealt with it. You see, she didn't just read books, and she, she really loved these books, but she said this, I could be one of your teachers, though I'm not a great one for analyzing these novels. I want to live by them. That's the meaning of my life. 
to live up to the moral vision of the church and of some of my favorite writers. This would have been a far lonelier life for me if I hadn't met Mr. Dickens or Mr. Tolstoy. And she, she goes on to talk about their wisdom. She said, I try to take those artists and novelists to heart and live up to their wisdom. Because, as you probably know, Dickens and Dostoevsky and Tolstoy kept thinking of Jesus themselves all through their lives. You see, it wasn't enough just to know the books, just to be aware of the books, just to be entertained by the books. Dorothy Day actually wanted to live the spiritual message of those books in founding the Catholic Worker Movement with Peter Morin, she managed to do that. It makes her such a compelling witness for peace. Isn't that remarkable? I mean, when you think about it, I mean, I, you know, you just can't uh, uh, imagine the kind of life she lived. She was in the upper crust of the literary people of her time. She knew John Dos Passos and Ernest Hemingway and, and uh, Eugene O'Neill was a drinking buddy of hers, the great uh, playwright. Um, and the, the thought that she uh, lived in those circles and wrote and uh, had a great career as a writer um, makes us kind of amazed that she turned to God and to the poor and uh, in her turning she used her talent, her writing to, to once again display to people how to turn ourselves. I'll give you an example. She's talking about when she fell away from her faith here. This is, a, this is quite a, a passage. And she, the reason she fell away from her faith is she thought Christians had betrayed their own moral stance. That's a classic way that people fall away from faith. The, this is the reasoning. This is where my reasoning finally led me, she says. On the one hand, there were the religious people I had come up against in church, and they were few, I must admit a sparse congregation meeting on Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings. They had enough money so they didn't have to bother about the things of the world. There were also the worldlings, the tycoons, the people I read about, who piled up fortunes and cornered wheat and exploited the workers in the stockyards, right? I did not know those people myself, but I knew the rich were smiled at and fawned upon by the churchgoers. That's all I could see. Children look at things very directly and simply. I didn't see anyone taking off his coat and giving it to the poor. I didn't see anyone having a banquet and calling in the lame, the halt, and the blind. And those who were doing it, like the Salvation Army, they didn't appeal to me. I wanted, though I did not know it then, a synthesis. I wanted life, and I wanted the abundant life. I wanted it for others, too. I did not want just the few, the missionary-minded people, like the Salvation Army, to be kind to the poor, as the poor. I wanted everyone to be kind. I wanted every home to be open to the lame, the halt, and the blind, the way it had been for her after the San Francisco earthquake, which she lived through as a little child. In such love was the abundant life, and I didn't have the slightest idea how to find it. But boy, she was going to look for it, right? That was Dorothy. One step she made toward that, as a student, she became a socialist. Okay. Continues on here about the loss of her faith. This is worth pondering, friends, because 
this is happening in our own society over and over again, I think. So she, she talks about these friends she had. That she enjoyed them. They were good Christians. They were Methodist. And, and she would even share the New Testament readings with the kids and things like that when she was uh, cooking for the family as a student. But even as I talked about religion, I rejected religion, she says. I had read Wesley's sermons and had been inspired by them. I had sung hymns from the Episcopalian hymnal to put little John to sleep. I had read the New Testament with fervor. But that time was past, she says. I felt, listen to this, I felt so intensely alive that the importance of the here and now absorbed me. The radicalism I absorbed from the other readings she had done was now uh, working its way through her soul, okay? And her position was that after reading Jack London and Upton Sinclair and those people, was from the site of poverty, I'm in conflict with religion, okay? Remembering how much I liked the Fitzgeralds, that was that Methodist family she knew, I was happy in their religious atmosphere, and yet I scorned the students that were pious. Youth, I felt, should be, not be in a state of peace, but in war. In other words, she felt like the Christians were too complacent, okay? That's how she felt. I was, uh, in my reading, she says, I must have absorbed a scorn of religion at that time. A consciously critical attitude toward religious people who were so comfortably happy in the faces of the injustices of the world. How about that? So she goes on with her journey. God keeps knocking at the door. And at a very dramatic point, she's in a bar with her, with her literary friends. And the great playwright, Eugene O'Neill, this is what she says. She's there with Eugene O'Neill, Michael Gold, and others. And she, this is how she describes it. No one ever wanted to go to bed, and no one ever wished to be alone. So they, they, were, in the, they were drinking all night and talking with each other and, and in, the, in the flame of youth. They didn't want to go to bed. They, you know, like that. So it was on those cold, bitter evenings in Chicago. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is in New York. Forgive me. Uh, that I first heard The Hound of Heaven. You know the, the poem, The Hound of Heaven by uh, Francis Thompson? You know, I fled him, uh, and then the hound of heaven keeps coming at the person, and of course the hound of heaven is God. It's a famous poem. And get this. Jean, Eugene O'Neill, Jean, that's how she refers to this, most, one of the most famous playwrights of the 20th century, could recite all of Francis Thomas's poem by memory. And he would sit there, black and dour, his head sunk as he intoned that poem. And then she quotes, and now my heart is as a broken fount wherein tear dripping stagnate. So that's right, that's right at the, like the turning point of the poem where the heart is broken and the person's ready to turn back to God. The idea of this pursuit by the hound of heaven fascinated me, she says. The recurrence of it, the inevitableness of the outcome made me feel that sooner or later I would have to pause in the mad rush of living and remember my first beginning and my last end. So here she's beginning to hear the call of God. And then she goes on. Many a morning after all, sitting all night in the taverns, this was an energetic person, by the way. I, I can't imagine this kind of life. Many a morning after sitting all nights in taverns or coming from balls on Western Webster Ave Hall, I went to an early morning mass at St. Joseph's Church at 6th Avenue and knelt in the back of church, not knowing what was going on at the altar, but warmed and comforted by the lights and silence, the kneeling people, and the atmosphere of worship. People have so great a need to reverence, to worship, to adore. 
It's a psychological necessity of human nature that must be taken into account. Is that, ooh. We do not like to admit how people fail us. Even those most loved show their frailty and their weakness. No matter how we may will to see only the best in others, their strength rather than their weakness, we are all too conscious of our own failings and recognize them in others. She goes on, a friend who has no formal religion or belief once said to me that surely some such great cataclysm as the fall must have taken place to explain the evil in the world. Original sin and the gravitational pull toward the animal and man were easy to understand, accepting this fundamental teaching. I think she was able to understand it because she was reflective, by the way. I, certainly, I felt again and again the need to go to church, to kneel, to bow my head in prayer. And it was a blind instinct, one might say, and I was not conscious of praying, but I went. I put myself there in the atmosphere of prayer. It was an act of the will. It seems to me a long time that I led this wavering life in my ignorance not knowing that we are a body, mind, and soul, and that all our faculties, she says, can be brought into harmony. So you, you heard before, she's looking for the synthesis. She's looking for the harmony. She's looking for it to kind of fit together, and she keeps on journeying. She, she goes along in her life. She manages one of her novels gets turned into a screenplay um, and she gets a lot of money for it in those days five thousand dollars that was a lot of money so she could she plopped a bunch of it to a beach house on the Jersey Shore it's not like houses on the Jersey Shore are now it was it was quite primitive but it was a beach house on the Jersey Shore for its time, and she could do writing there. And, and she uh, fell in love with a biologist uh, who was an Englishman who had no faith at all. And they have a, a baby together. And once the baby comes, I'm, I'm, I'm reviewing the whole story here because time is short. The baby comes. Dorothy says to herself, I'm not going to put this baby through what I went through. I'm going to get this baby baptized. So she seeks out baptism for the baby. And she, as she's seeking out baptism for the baby, she comes to the Catholic Church herself. And her journey is radically changed. And the man that she married, because of World War I, he didn't think that a child should be brought in the world first place. He was an anarchist, so he didn't want to really be responsible for the child. And they eventually had to break. She broke off her relationship with the man so she could follow the church's way. And that's why she did it. And uh, that's, it, there's a great deal of pain in that choice she does not uh she says some of her radical friends said oh you just wanted to give up sex and she said absolutely not she said my relationship with this man opened me to god but he didn't want to go along with my journey and so i had to break it off but if he had uh, just gone through a ceremony with the catholic church she just stayed married to him, interestingly enough. But he didn't want any, he didn't want a civil ceremony or a religious ceremony because he was he was a uh, a biological anarchist. And because of the wounds of World War I. See? So he uh, uh, she left Forrester and the daughter gets baptized and then um, uh, she comes into the Catholic Church, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, she encounters Peter Morin, who explains to her some of the depth of Catholic social teaching, and the Catholic Worker newspaper takes off in the Depression. 
it was an idea that people needed at the time. And uh, uh, it, it went on that um, way. She says here, the problem is how to love God. We're only too conscious of the hardness of our hearts. And in spite of all that religious writers tell us about feeling not being necessary, we do want to feel and so know that we love God. Thou wouldst not seek him if thou hadst al not already found him, Pascal says. And it is true, too, that you love God if you want to love him. One of the disconcerting facts about the spiritual life is that God takes you at your word. This is, this is really remarkable. Sooner or later, one is given a chance to prove his love. The very word diligo, the Latin word used for love, means I prefer. It was all very well to love God and his works and the beauty of his creation, which was crowned for me by the birth of my child. Forrester, that, her common-law husband, had made the physical world come alive for me and had awakened in my heart a flood of gratitude. No human creature could receive or contain so vast a flood of love and joy as I often felt after the birth of my child which with this came the need to worship, to adore. I heard many say that they wanted to worship God in their own way and did not need a church in which to praise him, nor a body of people with whom to associate themselves. But I did not agree to this, she says. I did not. This is, this is crucial to, to Dorothy Day. Listen to this. Her very radicalism brings her to the church. I did not agree to this. My very experience as a radical, my whole makeup, led me to want to associate myself with others, with the masses, in loving and praising God. Without even looking into the claims of the Catholic Church, I was willing to admit that for me, she was the one true church. She had come down through the centuries since the time of Peter, and far from being dead, she claimed and held the allegiance of the masses of people in all the cities where I had lived. They poured in and out of her doors on Sundays and holy days for novenas and missions. What if they were compelled to come in by the law of the church, which said that they were guilty of mortal sin if they didn't go to mass every Sunday? So she's even answering the objection here. This is great. They obeyed that law. They were given a chance to show their preference. They accepted the church. It may have been an unthinking, unquestioning faith, and yet the chance certainly came again and again. Do I prefer the church to my own will? Even if it was only the small matter of sitting at home on a Sunday morning with the papers, and the choice was the church. How about that? Even if it was a small matter of sitting at home and watching the screen. It, I mean, in those days it was the papers, but now it's this. And yet, the droves that the, most of the people, uh, most of the people who see this YouTube aren't going to church. They've rejected the church of Dorothy Day. I, I'm, I'll just say it very bluntly. But I think Dorothy Day is inviting them even now to go back to church, to think about her own journey. Read, read the book, The Long Loneliness. Take a look at it yourself. It, it's really a wonderful read. It's a wonderful story. And, you know, I hope, I can't even begin to uh, say more about it because I'm out of time. But the, uh, the, the point is, is that she has an authentic call to the poor, an authentic call to uh, 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 a vision of social justice, and most importantly, an authentic call to Jesus. I want to close with Dorothy Ranahan's reflection. What changed Dorothy Ranahan when she was Dorothy Garrity 
1960, she was a, uh, uh, a freshman at Duquesne. And she's at Duquesne, and somebody says, you've got to go hear Dorothy Day. And she said, uh, here's what she says. She says, when I was a freshman, I was quite conservative politically. She was an ardent fan. Now, I, can't, I can't even think about this. Dorothy Renahan was an ardent fan of Ayn Rand novels and the idea, uh, the, the, uh, uh, cons uh, her ideology of individualism. Then one day I found myself sitting on a classroom floor listening to Dorothy Day. She says, I left that room a different person. No lecture reshaped me so thoroughly as that one in the fall of 1960. Who is Dorothy Day anyway? I asked my friend as we planted ourselves in the corner of the large crowded classroom. What she told me, her writing for various socialist newspapers, founding houses of hospitalities for vagrants, advocacy for pacifism, it didn't at all impress me. The room was crammed and I was already uncomfortable and beginning to wish I hadn't come. This is, this is, this is precious. Uh, Day be began to speak her voice halting, measured, barely audible. When a space cleared among the tangle of people in front of me, I caught a glimpse of her, perched unceremoniously on a tall wooden stool. Long legs crossed, sat the radical fanatic. Her gray hair pulled up in braids that wound up across the top of her head. She didn't look like a fanatic, but if radical means exposing the root of a difficulty and advocating extreme measures, she certainly was radical. She struck a deep nerve. As I listened, this is what Dorothy says, as I listened, I felt a pain within that throbbed like a toothache. Well, yeah, that's all that Anne Rand knocking around in her head. That's what I think. On one level, Day had made me confront a previously hidden ideology and worldview. I was politically naive. I knew nothing about poverty and pacifism. But I met them in this elderly woman's words and in her eyes. What she said filled me with fear, confusion, and even anger. Right? I mean, of course, if you, if you were an Ann Randite and you're listening to Dorothy Day, that's how you're going to respond at first. It hurt. In her, I saw what it means to be truly poor in spirit, filled to overflowing with a peace for which I hungered. She exuded peace, even in the face of hostile remarks that welled up in the crowded classroom after her talk. It was clear she'd encountered them before. Peace sat with her. She called him Jesus. His coming to earth announced peace on earth, and he was sent so that the poor might have good news preached to them. His mission became hers. No pain, persecution, impoverishment, or imprisonment prevented her from doing what she had come to perceive, not only as God's will, but as God's way. Afterward, I bantered with the professor who had arranged for her to come. Is she crazy or what? He looked at me with unusual seriousness and said, she's either crazy or quite possibly a saint. A saint. Perhaps that is what it is, I thought that lofty idealism and a quiet, passionate, burning zeal for following the Lord, whatever the cost. Perhaps even this saint had some wrong ideas, but I doubt it. I have come to share many of the ideals that Dorothy Day preached and lived. The poverty part is tough. My zeal often stalls, but I'm working on it. Would that there were fewer verbal tennis matches are about peace and more witnesses to living it. Radical saints, perhaps it could change the world. Truth spoken by saints moves the soul. Thank you very much.